access the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845 and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 148 of the podcast of OA. I'm Myron Rumsey and joined by our good buddy, Phil Bova. Phil, my friend, how is life? Life is great, man. Life is great. School's school's going well. Kids are uh, actually behaving this year for a change, which is odd. <laughs> but uh, things are going great, man. St. Louis is going well and uh, looking forward to the fall. That's great. Yeah, the weather here is starting to change. Um, I live in the Finger Lakes in New York, and it just gets really beautiful as the leaves start to change because we've got a lot of rolling hills, and, and it's just it gets to be gorgeous. And we're just on the cusp of that now, so I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, so are we. I'm, I, I'm just done with the heat. I think we got a few more days of 90s down here, and then it, and then it finally, hopefully, falls off. But we'll see. So, so this episode, we're going to set our way back machine to 1959 and we're going to go back and talk about showcase 22, 23 and 24. All right. I'm looking forward to it. I'm kicking it real old school. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go much further back than that and stick with the Green Lantern Corps mythology. Otherwise you're back in the golden age. Uh, so this is going to be really exciting. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's funny to think we've done 147 episodes and this book, these books really haven't been discussed, you know, I, on and off. Um, and one of the things that, that I, I want to point people to is uh, I think some of the best writing I've done in the blog of OA was during the 75th anniversary of Green Lantern. And I did a whole series of articles um, age by age. I started with the, sil- the Gold Age, then I went to the Silver Age, then the Bronze Age. And I did two articles for each era. And I did one kind of the history of the, the franchise and then one highlighting little mini biographies of the people that were really kind of the most influential during that era so i'm gonna i'm gonna link to those but the articles on the silver age are really relevant for our conversation this evening and uh if you go back and read those you'll you'll hear some of the things we're going to talk about in this episode but maybe in a little bit greater detail so yeah i'll put those in the show notes for people but yeah i'm really jazzed to talk about all this stuff because this is this is the beginning this is the foundation and and the core of the new mythology and not only that it really really uh the, the cool thing about Hal Jordan is he really reflects, he really, really reflects the time of American history, you know, back during those Cold War days and, uh, and, and the development of technologies and, and, you know, and then you got your space race on top of it, you know, and it's just, it's this culmination of a lot of cool scientific stuff that was, that was culminating out of, out of our country during that time. And it's really kind of reflected in these pages. Yeah, if you go back and think about 1959, you know, Russia was leading the space race. They'd already put a couple of monkeys up in space. The Cold War was really on. It's it's right in the cusp of JFK uh, being in his way to becoming the president. You know, this is kind of the, the, the years leading up to that. And, and just to kind of set the tone for this, if you think about how far technology has gone, back in 1959, domestic pa- jet passenger service had just started. So flying was really uh, a, a glamorous thing back then. And to be part of uh, the test pilot era, you know, this is the, this is really the Chuck Yeager part. We haven't really entered the space race ourselves yet. So this is pre-Mercury astronaut era. And, that, you know, and you're coming off, you know, two significant wars, you know, and, and being a pilot was an, a, an admirable position, you know, and that's what really reflects how Jordan's character and his dad's for that matter. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really a, a very glamorous thing, and and to look at it from the the comic perspective, Julie Schwartz was uh, a lot of people talk about Stan Lee being the godfather of comics, and and that may be true to some extent, but you wouldn't have Stan Lee if it wasn't for Julie Schwartz, and Julie Schwartz was the guy who decided to revitalize era uh, comic book characters. For the Atomic Age, you know, he was he was an editor at DC. He was a former literary agent, a lifelong sci-fi fan. And he actually was a uh, in a sci-fi fan club 
with people that became very famous. And he was a literary agent for people like Alfred Bester and a number of other authors that were sci-fi writers. And so he really wanted to bring comic book characters back out of this slump from the whole end of the golden age and the seduction of the innocent and all that stuff. And uh, this, this time these books we're going to talk about are the second time that Julie Schwartz revives a golden age character revitalizes a golden age character on the pages of showcase. The first was the flash and uh, he was really big, like I said, in the sci-fi. So he was trying to put um, more of a sci-fi edge on these characters versus magic, which is what you had before. So, you know, Alan Scott was magic. Um, you, all those characters were more mystical in nature. And now we were trying to go into more of a scientific spin, a sci-fi spin on stuff. And John Broom, who is writing all three of these issues and was the main architect of everything we know about Green Lantern, he worked on Alan Scott stories and Alfred Bester, who is a sci-fi author, he was then doing it. And uh, Alfred Bester actually came up with the Green Lantern Oath. Alfred Bester turned down the Green Lantern books. And so Schwartz turned to John Broom. Incidentally, John Broom was Julie Schwartz's best man at his wedding. Huh, that's interesting. So John Broom's version of how Jordan is a man of science who is as apt to solve a problem with his mind as he was with his fists. <clears throat> and then he was partnered with Gil Kane uh, and Joe Giella, who we've talked about recently on the show. And Gil Kane came up with the with the design. And at one time, Paul Newman was Gil Kane's neighbor. And he used Paul Newman as an artistic reference point for Hal Jordan. Huh. That's really, really, that's that's kind of funny. It, it, it is. It's, it's really cool. And, and Sinestro was designed um, based on, um, oh gosh, I'm going to, I'm going to forget the name now. Um, I, I'll remember it here in a minute, but um, he, he used a lot of, of life references for things. And Gil made a really interesting analogy to way, the way comic books were back in the day. Back then, um, and, and I'm going to quote Gil Kane. He said plots were generally puzzles with an unexpected resolution that left the artist with one or two panels of action in which to punch the villain out. So, you know, back then these stories were one and done and, and they were basically, a, they'd throw a conundrum at the hero. The hero would have to figure out how to solve it. And then he'd beat the villain at the end and you, you would be done. And usually these stories would have some kind of a scientific bent to them. And there would be information in there about, um, scientific principle. So you'd have editor's footnotes and you'd have things like that, um, that kind of thing. But um, Sinestro was designed based on David Niven. I knew I was going to remember it. Just to be a few minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. And not to mention a lot of these books too had uh, two stories per book. You know, they, they had split stories a lot. Right, right. We're talking back in a day when there were 25 pages in a book for 10 cents. And uh, Showcase 22, which is going to lead the show off, actually had three, diff three different stories in it. But yeah, the, you're right. The, the other two books had two stories apiece. You know, you'd have a 13-page story and a 12-page story, generally speaking. And interesting, uh, interestingly enough, uh, for those that are unaware of it, but a lot of these, I got mine in the collection. It's in the uh, the Silver Age, Volume 1. And uh, a lot of them, when they do show the cover, if they look up at the top right, that's the uh, Common Code's Authority stamp. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that was that was that whole part of that whole uh, McCarthyism scare with communism and everything. And a lot of this was uh, propagated in the comic book industry. They even had book burnings during those times. Yeah, and that, that's one of the reasons why, one of the couple of reasons why Golden Age books are so uh, valued is one is because they were burned a lot, and the other was that they were turned in for paper drives during World War II. Uh, I, I have... Um, I'm I'm lucky enough to own Showcase 22. I don't own 23 and 24, but I have the hardcover archive editions that DC did a number of years ago, and and they're just a lot of fun to go back and reread. Yeah, they really are, and the, you know, and the art's good the, the, during that time frame too. I still like that that classical art. I mean, it's come a long way. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's hard to sit here and compare this to Liam Sharp, but it's like for that time, you know, this is kids looking at artwork like this. You know, it's 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 pretty amazing. Well, yeah. And, and again, they were drawing more pages. They also didn't have, I don't think, as good of tools as they have now to do some of this. Well, stuff. not only that, the conditions they probably were writing in weren't the greatest either. True, true. And and I don't know as if from a printing perspective, they had the full color palette that they have now. Yeah, that's also true. 
But uh, so we'll be back in in, in a moment, and uh, we'll start talking about showcase number twenty two. All right. My name is John Mayo, and I'm Bob Brito. What is the weekly comics spotlight? Comics reviews from two fans with 65 years of combined comics reading experience who each get and read well over 100 different comics each month from Marvel, DC, and a wide variety of independent publishers. Reviews that highlight books that may not hit everyone's radar screen since most people don't buy so many different comics each month. Reviews with honest opinions. We enjoy comics but realize not every issue that we read is a solid gold masterpiece. All in about 30 minutes. So please check out the Weekly Comic Spotlight at www.comicbookpage.com slash podcast. All right, the cover date of this issue is October of 1959. Showcase number 22, John Broom, Gil Kane, doing three stories in this issue. Uh, the first one being SOS Green Lantern, which is the origin of Hal Jordan getting the power ring. And it's only six pages long. Can you believe that? Yeah, but it's not only is it six pages, it's six pages, six pages of, of definite awesomeness that came to Hal Jordan's origin story. Yeah, and it's 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 actually only five pages of story because the first one is a splash page, which is just one of those. It's almost like its own cover. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But uh, it, it's it's really kind of neat, you know. We, we it opens right up with with Ab and Sir crash landed on a on Earth in a spaceship, and it's one of those things that obviously at the time nobody questioned, but long time readers and readers years years gone by are like, well, why is Ab and Sir? flying a spaceship and it took 27 years for Alan Moore to answer that in the pages of tigers and that Abin Sur, as we now know, was kind of seduced by the five inversions and he didn't trust his power ring. Well, and not only that, you're thinking about the fifties, man, science fiction back then was, was a whole different totality to kids, you know, aliens were big, you know, and like, and then of course along comes the sixties and it explodes even further. But, I mean, the fifties were big into that whole old school, that old Scott sci-fi stuff, and Abin Sur is like your your typical alien from that from that decade. Yeah, you know, very very humanoid looking, and, and it's interesting because most of the time back in the days, because of cinema, most aliens we saw were not friendly. Right, right. But Abin Sur's yeah, Abin Sur's there, and uh, he he of course t- beckons the rain to go find somebody. Uh, that, that is worthy of the ring and he has to be without fear and the ring, the, the power ring transcends the earth at the speed of light and finds Hal Jordan who is in not really a, a an airplane trainer but a trainer for uh, something that would train space pilots so very very much foreshadowing what's to come in terms of the reality of space travel and you know his flight trainer is picked up and taken a, a, quite a ways off. And something you know, it's interesting. I don't think I picked up on this point until now that Avin Sir and Hal Jordan really don't exchange words. It's all telepathy. Yeah, I just now I was just now when I was reading that panel there briefly, I noticed that about the telepathy thing, and I was like, oh, that's new. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny. I don't know how many times I've read this issue, this issue, and uh, never, never dawned on me they weren't actually even talking. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, that is kind of cool. But, you know, Abin Sur does kind of all the exposition. He's outlining the 24-hour charge. He's outlining the yellow weakness. But he doesn't tell how, how the ring works, how to use it, what it's capable of. Uh, he basically just says, you know, it's a huge responsibility to to kind of patrol space and, you know, and, and right wrongs and, and so on. And, and something I think that, that is really important is that uh, Avin Sir talks about, you know, there being two tests. It wasn't just that you had to be without fear, but you had to be honest. <laughs> which, which I think we all both know that um, when it comes to any Green Lantern, there's there's not a maybe a fraction of honesty amongst them at all. <laughs> I mean, the Guardian <laughs> being the worst of it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It's interesting, but, you know, it, it's one of those things that goes back to Hal had to be not only fierce, but he had to be worthy of the ring. Right. Which is another word for honesty, right? Right, right. You, you, you had to be worthy of it. It, it, it. it wasn't something that would just anybody could pick up and use. You had, you had to be worthy of it in order to get it, um, which which I think is important. Um, and he gives a little bit of background. He, again, he talks about the impurity and all that stuff. And, uh, and then 
Uh, Hal gets the ring. He gets the, the battery. He, he immediately lifts a cliff into the air and does some things with the ring. And then, you know, he does something kind of creepy. Uh, you know, the Abinsur's outfit is not made of energy, not like the way it is in the comics now. It's actually a cloth costume. So so after Abinsur dies, Hal takes the clothing off the dead body and puts it on. Like, ew, you know? <laughs> it is kind of it is kind of unflattering. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a little macabre. Good old Hal, man. And 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 Abin Sur never refers to it as Green Lantern. Hal names himself Green Lantern in this. Yeah, okay. And actually, Abin Sur knew who it was before he even came into the module. And come in, Hal Jordan. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting. You know, it, it's like there's a lot of little shortcuts. It's it's almost you know nowadays we talk a lot about decompressed storytelling. This is compressed stellate storytelling. <laughs> it really is. Because they don't even think it's, he doesn't even get to the oath by the end of the first this first little one, does he? No, no. And that that's something I was going to point out is when he recites the oath, who told him the oath? Because he never heard it from Abin Sur. It's never mentioned here. Yeah, I was going to say maybe the battery told him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's some things are kind of left up in the air like that, uh, and then it jumps to the next story. You know that that was five pages, six pages, and we're jumped in into Hal's next adventure, and it's the secret of the flaming spear. And we get the introduction of Carol Ferris and, and the relationship between Hal and Carol reminds me a lot of like, you know, from the Rock Hudson Doris Day movies. Oh yeah. That's a good, that's a good comparison. Yeah. And I love the way I love her. I love her hair and I love how she's drawn back then. She reminds me of Lois Lane that was drawn. I liked how Lois Lane was portrayed back then too. Well, and, and I think, you know, the dynamic between Hal and Carol is very much like the dynamic between Clark and, and, and Lois. Yeah. I would agree with that. And and here it's interesting that that uh, you know Hal walks right in and he's right in her space. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think in this day and age he might not be able to get away with that unless they had a really good relationship. But we don't know what the relationship really is. Uh, clearly, they have more than just friendship going on. But you can tell from Carol right here that she really uh, isn't uh, one of these people that likes to mix biz- mix business with pleasure. I mean, Hal kind of comes up behind her and she goes, really, Mr. Jordan, it seems to me you should attend to your own affairs on your own time. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's some strong female words right there. Right, right. Well, she is, she's a very strong female. Again, think about this being 1959. And I you know. talk about female empire, empowerment. By the time this story is over, in these nine pages, Carl Ferris turns the company over to Carol while he goes away on a two-year trip overseas. I know. It, it, and that, I talked about that a lot in uh, some of my uh, post-World War II uh, feminist movement and about uh, how a lot of these uh, females that were portrayed in comics were, in fact, empowered. by you know, like Lois Lane's one of them. I mean, you know, being a journalist at a high esteemed uh, uh, publishing company, you know, was, was, was a really, really, really strong position, especially with how she was written, too. Absolutely. Now, you know, one of the things that's interesting here is um, Hal was supposed to fly the flaming spear, but but couldn't because he he didn't show up on time. But the person that they give the flaming spear to is a guy by the name of Frank Nichols. Frank now, Nichols, yeah. Frank Nichols becomes Frank Leminski. Oh, okay. See, I didn't know that. Yep. When when Jeff Johns redid Secret Origin, he redoes this whole flaming spear thing. And it's Frank Leminski, who we now also know becomes the Phantom Lantern in the Green Lantern's story. Oh, interesting. There you go. Look at you drawing that comparison. <laughs> so the same the same plane is used when Jeff Jazz did Secret Origin, if, you know, back in Green Lantern number 30. And so it, it becomes Frank Leminski, but here it's Frank Nichols. And Hal, Hal as Green Lantern, rescues him. You know, he does recite the oath. I think what's interesting about these old stories is every time before Hal's about to go do something, he charges his ring. <laughs> I know. It's super cool. I, the only I'm for, I love that panel, you know, and I'm really, really, a, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the panel because that's the first time the oath is said. But it always gets me the way his right arm is kind of just looks kind of long, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you kind of wonder if they were kind of quick to to do things. But uh, how how rescues the 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 flaming spear, and we're trying to figure out what happened. And there's a radiation beam of some sort that was bringing the ship down, and Hal tries to trace it back uh, to to a projector, and Hal transports himself through a wall without breaking it, and uh, explodes some bullets. 
takes him down. It's it's neat. There's a line where where uh, he flies in, and the guys are, the, there are three of them, and one of them says, "What if that ain't a bird? It ain't a plane, and it sure ain't Superman," which I thought was cute. That is cool. <laughs> Whoever he is, he's not paying us a friendly visit. Shoot him down. <laughs> See, that's just the, the, that's just a classic one line from this era of comic books. I mean, seriously, I don't even think I've ever seen that line in any modern comic book this day. <laughs> no, no. And, and then, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that these early stories fall into the trap of is we know that the ring has a yellow weakness. So everything Hal seems to encounter is yellow. So a guy yeah. goes to throw a desk lamp. And it's an all yellow desk lamp. Like who owns an all yellow desk lamp? <laughs> he He throws that at him. And then they get away in a car because Hal gets hit by the lamp because he couldn't stop it. They get away in the car, and the car is also all yellow. <laughs> all yellow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like who owns the the a yellow car and a yellow a yellow uh, yellow lamp? But to stop the car, he punctures the tires, which is great. And then he drags them out <laughs> with, with his green uh, look like. They look like what is that? Electricity? They look like electricity beams or something? Yeah, they have the beams look very electrical. It, <laughs> and it, then it, it's cute stuff. <laughs> and then they, and then they meet up with Carl, Carl Ferris. Yep, and it's funny, you know. Here they call him Willard. Oh yeah, I didn't even pick up on that. Yep, right after right yeah. after uh, Carl uh, talks about how he's leaving, he and, and it's you know there's some backhanded compliments to to Carol when I mean, he talks about. You know, I always wanted a son, and and she's as done things as good as any boy could, kind of kind of thing. And I'm like, boy, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. Well, he said, I've always wanted to travel around the world before I get too old to enjoy myself. Miss Ferris and I will be gone two years. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, she's gone for two years, and then and then on a dime, Hal turns, and she's like, that, "That's it. You know, our relationship is going to be strictly business." Nothing more than that. You know, I've, I, I've promised my father I'm not going to have any romantic entanglements. <laughs> but don't, but, but you get, you can always count on old suave Hal. No yeah. Mixing business with pleasure. That's right. That's right. And, you know, at the end, he's sitting there going, what can I do? You know, I, I can do almost anything with my power ring, but it can't get me the one thing in the world I want most. Carol. <laughs> Foreshadowing the fact that he still doesn't ever have her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then and then we get to the next story, which is uh, the Menace of the Runaway Missile, which is what's on the cover of the issue, and that's the, of course, a yellow missile. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's funny. The issue starts out. Hal's in the locker room, and he puts on a suit to go and talk to Carol, which I think is is you know again that fifties that fifties notion. But he walks up behind her, puts his arms around her, and says, "Hi, honey." I'm thinking, boy, you know. <laughs> I know that's a full-on grope too. <laughs> but again, back in the day, that they had a relationship, and and he, I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but he's a little handsy, to be quite honest. Um, well, I mean, like you said, I mean, back in that, a lot of people like criticize the way comics were written and stuff like that. And it's like you know, I mean, you're you're basically criticizing society and what it was projected around, <laughs> you know. I mean, right. which you, you can't really. It's it's easy to do, but you can't really do it willy nilly. I mean, you got to do it for the, the right reasons and understand. Well, no, I don't agree with it, but again, this was a time frame that of, of which women and men coexisted, and unfortunately, there was a lot of you know sketchy things that were done over the course of time on what we consider today unsavory. Yeah, it is true, and you, and you can't judge uh, the events of the past through a modern lens certainly no. today in today's day you couldn't do that and you know when you see the retelling in secret origin you certainly don't see that kind of behavior but exactly back, back yeah. here it was just it was commonplace uh you know how is that that guy that was the debonair person and they had a relationship and it wasn't uncommon for that but i mean you see that one page where he's he's basically got his hands on the filing cabinet with with carol trapped <laughs> yeah, it pretty much does and i'm like boy that's you know again as a kid reading it back in the day you wouldn't have thought anything of it but looking at it from today's perspective boy that's that's really pushing the line <laughs> it's it really crossing is, the line man. it really is and it's like you're, you're looking at it in this nuanced approach and you're like yeah that's definitely a no-no <laughs> I mean, there's no way there's no way that would ever exist and, and then hal falls into the clark kent trap where, uh, you know, Green Lantern is becoming a, a bit of a, a man about town. And 
he's been invited to this ball. So Carol goes there in hopes of um, running into Green Lantern, which so much for the the no romantic entanglement clause in her contract. But uh, again, Hal charges his ring before he goes to the party. And they're kissing, and he sees this yellow missile flying by and takes off rather abruptly. Leaves Carol right there in, in, in partial kiss. I mean, their lips were locked. <laughs> and he goes off, and he can't, of course, stop the yellow missile right away. But fortunately, the guy with the yellow missile, whoever did the yellow missile, left the tip red. So he was able to catch it in a power ring net. Again, the construct being very, um, very electric looking. It is. I'm trying. I don't know. I'm trying to understand what it was like that back then. But you know, it's not the constructs that you see now, definitely. But I mean, but more often than not, a lot of times with like these different stylized versions of constructs or word bubbles, they're always associated with a certain some. You know, like uh, the little dots or the thought bubbles, and the you know, and like the little lightning strike is usually like a, a thought. Not really a thought bubble, but one that's projected by telepathy. And again, these different stylized versions of his constructs just look like they're all electric, electric bolts. <laughs> so it looks like. Yeah, I think they're trying to trying to underscore the fact that it's energy. Yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, I guess that'd be the best. Yeah, you're right. That I thought it was sense. funny. I thought it was funny to see how pick up the rocket. <laughs> it's it's not only yeah. yellow, but it's lightweight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I love. Walks the- over and sets it down. I love the army guy. The army guy is sharing like information that he shouldn't be sharing with a civilian to Green Lantern. <laughs> he's so yeah, you know, it's a missile and radiation thing. We got we got people you know, all over the place looking for these things, watching out in the skies, and you know, it, it could be something like that. We have aircraft spotters everywhere. Here, let me show you their secret locations. <laughs> it's just ordinary explosive, but it's not nuclear, so don't worry about it too much. <laughs> There's there's one panel that has that really bugs me, and that's with uh, you can see Hal's eyes because they didn't draw yeah. the yellow white over. That stuff always bugs me, and I was reading this and I'm like, oh, they get the first issue they did it. <laughs> I mean, it looks like it looks like the shadow in that one. Yeah, you're right, you're right. But you you, you got to love the Gil Kane artwork. I mean, it's clean. It, yeah, sure, by today's standards, it's simplistic, but he has a way of of capturing um, action, which I think is very different for its era yeah yeah i would i would say that i mean I, I like the artwork i like the simplistic natures of this art artwork back in that time i mean sometimes don't get me wrong i mean this is no knock against any artist but a lot of times the artwork gets so complex it, it often takes away from the, the narrative you're trying to you're trying to really really focus on and like you and i have mentioned before we usually read sometimes an issue one or two or three times especially with the new lantern ones because of the complexity of them, and they're dense, both in narrative and in artwork. Yeah, these are these are obviously much simpler, but yeah, you see a lot of blank backgrounds. Yeah, but it, it's just you know, like you look at some of these buildings; they're literally boxes that are colored and they're flat and smooth, and <laughs> right, they got no definition to them. It's like, oh, that's just some shack. Ooh, there's a house. <laughs> <laughs> So he catches the guy, <laughs> but to me, the, the great point of this issue, this, this story within the issue is he, Green Lantern goes back to talk to Carol and Carol is ticked because, because he left in mid kiss and he's like, you're not objecting to that. The way you kissed me, I could tell. And he goes, well, you may have, I, it's the way you kissed me that I'm referring to. And if you had lost yourself in that kiss, the way you did, the way I did, your eyes would have been closed and you wouldn't even have seen that missile. <laughs> so she's mad because he wasn't as engaged in the kiss as she was. <laughs> good, good day, Mr. Green Lantern. I'm busy. So like, not only can he not catch a break as Hal Jordan, but now he can't catch a break as Green Lantern because he didn't, because he did his job. <laughs> it is, man. He burned her twice. Now he's really screwed. He's going to have to really earn some brownie points. But then again, you know, it's 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 their nature. I mean, how many times have we seen Carol get pissed off at Hal over the course of decades of reading about them, too? Yeah. I mean, you know? she, she slams the door on him. <laughs> I know. She really does. She's not having it. <laughs> Should have been your first sign, Hal. Yeah. <laughs> you might as well get used to it. <laughs> God. But uh, it, it, what what fun though three three stories in one issue is is pretty impressive. Now yeah you had twenty five pages, 
But you know, the other thing I noticed that's really different between these stories and the stories we read today is each one of these stories that the plot with the villain stays contained within the story. But there are little elements like the relationship between Hal and Carol. That's the one thing that carries over from issue to issue. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know what you mean. They, 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 and a lot of times you'll see that more so in the, in the current comic books. They'll have multiple multiple story progressions going on simultaneously and these back here were like the the first beginnings of multiple storylines that carry over from issue, issue to issue but like you said the relationship one is, is just one example of that narrative yeah that that's the one piece of ongoing narrative that you seem to see whereas the the villains and everything else it's almost like they're it's almost like they're incidental <laughs> Well, that they become supporting characters, you know, and they're they're guaranteed to show up. I mean, much like Lois Lane in in the Superman books. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's interesting is is in all three of these stories, there really isn't a villain of any note. Like, there's no super villain air quote in in any of these wow. stories. Yeah, I, I would venture to guess that a lot of a lot of your 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 villain stuff starts coming coming after this era more like in the 60s you know they spin out of the cold war you know i i don't know i mean historically speaking i've always thought of like this this enemy always being projected on on somebody who's done you harm you know and then of course you got the japanese you know which did america harm during world war ii and then of course next up you got you know the korean war but then also you have the cold war which the russians were the enemy for that time frame so a lot of times I've always associated those historical points as, as, as spots where they start coming up with significant villains that personify that kind of that kind of mentality. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, these were, these were people that were villains in and of their own right, but they didn't have powers yet. And, and that, yeah. changes, that changes with the next issue. But, uh, you know, for, for, the, for an origin issue, to get three stories and uh, – Three interesting, you know, a lot of action-packed stories in there. I can imagine as a kid back then being, you know, I want to find out more about this character. Well, and like you said, it's just it's just cool to read three different stories, you know, and because you get more bang for your buck, especially as a kid. And now you can't even get more bang for your buck when an adult. <laughs> right. Well, you know, again, it goes to today. A lot of these stories, a lot of the books we have now, the stories are five or six issues long. Um, so you don't get a complete story in an issue. Right. Also true. Or it's like doomsday clock. It's like, should have been over by now. <laughs> <laughs> they forgot to wind it. <laughs> anyway. Yes. These, these are cool. I like these a lot better than doomsday clock. That's for sure. So, um, <laughs> rather than stopping, let's keep going. So why don't you start talking about showcase 23? All right, so Showcase 23, we're going to go uh, the next uh, in December, December 1959. And, of course, uh, Gil Kane, Julie Schwartz is the executive ed editor. And so we start off, Green Lantern, next issue, he's fighting a yellow pterodactyl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this all brings back what you said about, okay, we're just going to throw yellow in for every kind of weakness that he has. So the first, uh, first story is called Summons from Space. So... Uh, Green Lantern, he's been making many, many public appearances. Uh, we go to the next page and shows that he's talking to some business tycoons. And then do you know who this, this, uh, golden haired woman is? Uh, no, um, I, I think she's just a, uh, a starlet or some debutante that, uh, that latches on to, on to Green Lantern. You know, he's becoming the man about town. And, uh, I think he's kind of, I think he's kind of trolling Carol a little bit here because he's making headlines being with all these different women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, I mean, she expresses her discontent in the next <laughs> over there on page uh, my page thirty six. I don't know what your page is, but yeah, she she def she definitely is not very happy about it at all. <laughs> well, and, and I think it's funny because she's like, you know, I, it's 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 just it's in the last seven days he's been reported with seven different beautiful girls, and Hal's sitting there with her at, at the lunch table. The but must be in the cafeteria at Ferris Air or something, and. uh on a coffee break. And he says, well, why should that strike you scandalous unless you were jealous? <laughs> He's really, you know, like, Hey, you know, I'm going to cheat her. Uh, I think it's well, funny. And then, and, then, and then of course she has to cite that employees shouldn't date. You know, yeah. So. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to throw you on the bus even further. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, and then Hal makes the slip up. He, he again falls into the trap. He says, uh, well, what did you expect 
after the way you treated Greenland and refusing even to speak to him on the phone. And she's like, well, how do you know that? And he was like, uh, well, we've become <laughs> friends. <laughs> What a, what a spot Carol is putting me in. <laughs> Poor Hal. <laughs> and then there's the little thought balloon Carol's got that says, the two men I find most att- two men I find most attractive in the world have now become friends. But maybe I was a bit hasty toward Green Lantern. I wonder. For someone who's who's sworn off any romantic relationship, she's spent an awful lot of energy. <laughs> you know, do you remember those? Uh, you, yeah, I know you're going to remember these. Uh, those old... Uh, radio serials where they had Superman and all them on there. And Oh yeah. 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 And, yeah. So I was like, I'm going to run up this, I'm going to run up these stairs. And then, you know, you hear the stairs going and you're like, I'm going to jump out this door. You know, <laughs> it's like a lot of, a lot of these comic books remind me of those and how those were read on, on the air throughout on the radio waves, you know, a lot of, cause a lot of times how they, how they pronunciate or how they explain themselves or they explain certain, certain things in the thought bubble. You know, it always harkens back to those old radio serials. Well, and then it's funny because you, you turn the page and, and again, Carol, who is saying, well, you know, there's going to be no relationship stuff. And then she says, well, uh, how about you take me to dinner sometime? <laughs> and, and it turns out to be a trap because she, she's like, well, sure, sure, Carol, we can go to dinner. And she says, well, maybe, you know, maybe it would be great if it wouldn't be such a risk if the three of us got together. Bring Green Lantern with you. <laughs> Since, he, since he's such a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. The corny it's just, banter. It's just great stuff. You know, it's, it's again, it's that Clark Kent Superman love triangle thing going on. So then we get to the next page. We see uh, how Jordan's sitting there and it looks like he's listening to the radio, but no, he's not. He's listening to the lantern itself because here comes the guardian speaking to him for the first time. Yes, it's, it's really cool. I mean, you don't—he doesn't know they're the guardians. He doesn't know there's anybody at the end. He literally thinks the lamp is talking to him. <laughs> to the possessor of the lamp, of the power lamp in sector two eight one four, an emergency has been arisen on the world called Venus in the solar system in which you live. You are the only lamp possessor <laughs> who can reach there in time. You must hurry. That's got to be jarring. To just be sitting there minding your own business, you know, <laughs> trying to pine after your boss. And she won't have you, and you're and you're feeling this really, really terrible because you can't have the girl you want. But no, you're just going to be told to get to go fly off to Venus to fight some yellow pterodactyl. <laughs> <laughs> so he has to. He takes off his clothes and he's got his uniform on underneath, um, and once of again course. charges his ring, <laughs> and uh, and heads off. The way- which, by the way, I have to say they, they they utilize it a lot more in these older books, and I don't think they I don't think they use it enough anymore. You're right. You're right. You know, I haven't heard. I mean, you only hear it every once in a while. That last issue was cool. The way they had the, the different variations of it, but um, yeah, you don't hear them very, say it very often. So he's propelled by the invincible power ring. The green green the green gladiator zooms off the Earth. So this is the first time he enters space, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's correct. At least on panel. He looks kind of chill about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and and he doesn't realize that the ring will create oxygen for him. So he wills the ring to provide oxygen to capture some enough oxygen to get him to Venus. <laughs> so he gets to Venus, which I don't. I, I mean, I had to. I'd have to brush up on my on my uh, planetary history, but isn't it, Venus isn't a gassy planet then, right? Not in the DC universe. Apparently, it's capable of supporting <laughs> life. And they're they're hey man. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see if I can point out some scientific, uh, you know, <laughs> possibilities in these in these in these books. You know, see what they were teaching kids back then. I know we're we're kind of laughing a lot at these, and we're not meaning to make fun of them. But again, knowing what we know about reality, it's 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 comical to see the you know flying there, and there's must be there's oxygen on Venus because he's no longer surrounded by a bubble, um, and then <laughs> and then the yellow pterodactyl shows up. And of course, Hal can't figure out what to do about that until he, he realizes, you know, this is the first time Hal decides, hey, if I can't solve it with the ring, I'm going to punch it. <laughs> you know, and then leave it, leave, it, leave it to them to think of a pterodactyl as an alien being on another planet. Because that's, I mean, if you think about it back in that time, you know, it's pretty much believable because dinosaur, you know, and the, the, the kids right. are going to draw the conclusion with the dinosaur. But, you know, of all alien plants that go to Venus, they throw us the pterodactyl. Well, and of it course, it's a good villain. 
If you're if you're gonna have a yellow pterodactyl, you gotta have blue blue cavemen on the, <laughs> on the planet. I mean, it only makes sense. <laughs> we need Saint Walker. Where's Saint Walker? Where's right. Saint Walker at when we need him? And and the ring doesn't uh, the ring doesn't automatically translate. So how wills it to translate for him? And that's the first time he learns how to know that it's a translator. Yeah, and and you know he's he's le- been left to his own devices. Um, so, you know, he's doing a good job of figuring out how to do stuff, but I just, I love the fact that they're cavemen that are blue. <laughs> I know they really are. They kind of like, like low rent He-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny cause this is the first time we see, um, you know, when, when the ring is translating, we get the little electrical effect again, but this time when he creates the giant green Falcon to chain, to chase away the yellow pterodactyls, the beam that comes out is smooth. So Gil Kane must've gotten tired of drawing zigzaggy lines. <laughs> <laughs> or it, again it, it could serve the purpose that it's supposed to be smooth because of the flight of the eagle that, he, that he's projecting it could be and, and again we we get a little bit of of technical scientific jargon about all this stuff and that uh, you know Hal says well birds are traditionally afraid of their fierce their fiercest members and the hawks so maybe i can secure them away by doing by making a giant hawk not a bad not a bad plan to be honest with you no, no, I think it's, you know, again, how, how thinking his way through, thinking his way out of a box. He, he traps them uh, to, to basically um, suffocate to death, um, but he leaves them trapped and, and saves the blue-skinned uh, Venusians and then flies back. And, so what do, you uh, think of the, what do you think of that one little panel where it's showing him, with the showing the thought bubble in his eyes, looking to the looks like I was looking, his right? Looking to the right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I, I, I think just, oh boy. Um, That's a tough one. It is, it is, but it is, it is what it is. And uh, he talks about one day the Venusians are going to be a great civilization. Um, yeah, but we'll see. Now here's the, I guess here, here's going to be a, a, a good note. Have they been used since then? Nope. <laughs> I think they forgot about them. Dang, poor Hal. Hey, have you noticed though in these in these uh, in these issues with how flying, how his legs are always like they're always like apart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. The, I, I, the, maybe they wanted to make him look a little different from Superman. I mean, earlier in the issue when he's got the girl and his arm around the girl flying, his legs are together. Um, no, this, <laughs> this issue looked like they were all apart. That's R- write your funny. own joke there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, here he's he's you know maybe he's trying to catch the air right I don't know but he gets back he gets back and of course the issue ends with him and Carol again and and basically Hal dodges the bullet by saying that Hal couldn't be there um, and so she's dancing with Green Lantern and you know and of course as she gets ready for bed that evening she's brushing her hair she's pining about Green Lantern again and you know sooner or later she's going to have to choose between Hal Jordan and Green Lantern but which will it be I can't begin to make up my mind. And uh, Hal realizes that Carol's falling in love with Green Lantern. So he's, again, stuck in this love triangle. Poor guy. And, you know, it's funny. It's still, it's still kind of ironic because he still hasn't gotten a girl. <laughs> after, this, after this long, that poor dude still hasn't gotten Carol Ferris. Poor Hal. What do you think about this issue so far? This issue's good. It, it's, it's good. It, it, again, it's Silver Age fun. Um there's, there's certainly the silliness, and you and, the guy, you and I have been having a lot of fun at, at the expense of some of this stuff. But again, it's still great stuff. So we'll move on to the next, the third story in this issue, which is the Invisible Destroyer. So this ought to be interesting. So Hal, once again, visiting Carol's office, because he's always walking in. You ever notice he never, never knocks? No, he just barges into the boss's office. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, He's showing an ad in the newspaper asking for Green Lantern's help. Well, that's kind of <laughs> interesting. Urgent. Even gives you the even gives you the times to, uh, where to go to. Yeah, you know, in in this day and age, if you publish something like that in the newspaper, you probably have a couple <laughs> hundred people show up with their cell phones trying to figure what's going on. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's comical, but you know, I mean, back then it would have been, you know, I guess it would have been different. Here we go, cite the oath once again, man. Here's here's Big Hal. I get to hear the oath again. Well, and and then when he, you know, he before he does that, she's trying to find out from Hal what he thinks about the uh, the ad. And I was like, well, if that's all you wanted to see about Carol, goodbye. And he leaves. So now she's ticked off that Hal left and gave her the cold shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> 
If that doesn't beat all. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I thought you wanted me, Hal. <laughs> yeah, she even says that. Usually he begs for a chance to talk to me. <laughs> but yeah, then he, he goes off to recite the oath and away he goes. In, his, in the privacy of his dressing room. I guess he get that's right. He kept his lamp in his locker on on the uh, on Ed Ferris aircraft, didn't he? Yeah, apparently he had his own dressing room. According to this, huh. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, well, you know, back then it was a glamorous occupation. These guys, these jet jocks, they they got treated right. <laughs> so he flies off, and then on the rooftops, he comes up against some the Phantom Thief. I guess Is that was just this. Villain's called the Phantom Thief. He's the Invisible Destroyer. Ah, oh, labeled. I'm sorry, labeled the Invisible Destroyer. Interesting. <laughs> well, at least he's not made of all yellow. No, but he's invisible, <laughs> and his pow- and Hal's power ring doesn't work on him either. Oh, well, that's true. I wonder whatever will Hal do. Okay, so again, I'm on page fifty here. We're going to go to the eye thing at the bottom left. Where he's looking to the left, talking to that uh, de- that uh, detective. Yeah, yeah. See, I wonder what it is, though. Now you got me paying attention to it all the time. <laughs> I'm ruining everybody's fan experience, I tell you. <laughs> well, I mean, and even if they do take notice of it, at least it'll be something that, you know, a lot of the fans that are listening to this, at least they'll be like, oh, you know, I remember when they mentioned that. That was kind of funny. And they might even draw their own conclusions about it. Because it is a different take on that kind of look. I mean, it just, it looks creepy, you know. Well, and what's interesting with the, with the Invisible Destroyer is he just kind of disappears for no reason. But they got photos of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hal, Hal does finally get to go to the, the house to answer the public notice. And, of course, these two story points coincide because the guy thinks he's the Invisible Destroyer. This is the old man, right? The guy who holds yeah, the yep. ring? Mm-hmm. So he shows up at the, at, the, at the guy's house and talks to him. And he was sketching and he was draw- he ended up drawing pictures of the Invisible, the invisible Destroyer before he'd actually been seen. Uh, so he thinks he's responsible for him. So Hal does something really interesting. He uses his power ring to um, make Dr. Phillips concentrate on the formula he's writing to see what happens. So he's almost doing mind control. Yeah, that's never really been one of his fortes either. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. But as it turns out, the Invisible Destroyer is kind of like an Atomic Age Jekyll and Hyde. That He's kind of the, the id of, of the scientist, of Dr. Phillips. And it's and it's really cool how they spun it like the atomic the atomic age equivalent, you know. And and eventually the uh, the invisible destroyer gets out of Doctor Phillips' brain and goes off on his own. Yeah, it really looks like he's lobotomizing him in that one panel. He's got yeah. a beam right directly at his <laughs> right at his forehead. Yeah, definitely. So far, I've only so far I've only broken into places where atomic radiation exists, like that cyclotron, and the reason is simple. I feed on radiation. So I guess this is some kind of essence thing, I, I guess it would be. Yeah, and you'll find a lot of a lot of the creatures and things that happen in these early stories, radiation is a common theme. It's like radiation is re- responsible for things well beyond what radiation can actually do. But, it, but, you know, it's a common thing for science fiction back in the day because radiation was one of those unknowns and people were afraid about radiation. And well, not uh, only not only that, you're on the you're on the getting close to the sixties, and that's where, you know, look at Hulk, you know, a Hulk came out of the sixties, and that was mm-hmm. you know radiation. Mm-hmm. You know, in radiation, you know, Godzilla and a lot of those, you know, a lot of the monsters in the movies were radiation driven. Mm-hmm. It's an easy one. It's an, and people can understand how a lot of times, you know, back in this Cold War, that would have, that would have been that that would have been that that communist undertone. You know, it had to do with radiation and the and the Red Scare. Absolutely. So reading this as a kid, you know, if you think about this from, from a kid's vantage point, this is going to be really hard to do. But you're reading about this 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 guy, you know, that got infected by this radiation, that's become a villain and is terrorizing. You know, imagine from a kid's perspective if you got a dad. You know, of course, it doesn't matter your political leanings, but you know you're on the cusp of a cold war with, with this with this nation of Russia. You know, where they know they're going to drop an atomic bomb or a nuclear bomb in our country. That's kind of that'd be daunting for a kid that age if they do that comparison, you know. And uh, Hal once again uses science to defeat the invisible destroyer because he's the man. And then you got and then you got to appreciate the last the, the last panel with him just like looking like he's pulling a suit, like he's like he's you know he's no you know what with this Green Lantern thing hanging up back there. 
in clear <laughs> view of everybody, apparently, because when you walk in, anybody can see that. Now, the Invisible Destroyer has shown up um, in, in years subsequent, not so much as a HAL villain, but he showed up in the background as a very minor, like, you know, you talk about the D-list. I think he's like the G-list. Um, but he, <laughs> he he did show up on a couple of occasions, not necessarily in the Green Lantern books, but uh, I think he showed up on in a JLA issue once. And I think he was in the Mark Wade uh, JLA Year One miniseries. It's so it's so interesting to me when they when they utilize old characters that are you know obscure ones, especially somebody like him. You know, I mean, when, and then whereas you know, <laughs> you might see a yellow pterodactyl somewhere. Like, man, I wonder if that's been done before. <laughs> Yeah, that was that way back in Showcase 23. <laughs> so uh, that that's the end of issue number 23. So, you know, we're, we're going into the third issue now. At this point, DC doesn't really know yet how well this character's taken off. So they, they've given the character three, three issues to try to sell himself. So we go into the third issue. And the third issue, again, has two stories in it, a 13-pager and a 12-pager. And the first one is The Secret of the Black Museum. Now, it's not related to Black Hand. It's not the Hand family. But uh, it is a museum. And uh, Hal, uh, Carol's walking around to start. She's you know, she's she's convinced she's going to marry Green Lantern now. She's contacted Carl Ferris. And uh, she's persuaded him to let her, let her marry Green Lantern. Green Lantern doesn't know it yet. But, but she's, uh, you know, her, her romantic life is obviously much more important than somebody's safety because she and Hal are sitting on a park bench and she's sure he's about to propose and he hears a cry for help and goes off to rescue someone. And Carol's kind of ticked off that, uh, Hal took to walk, took to off to go rescue someone and save their life. And when he shows back up, uh, he's like, oh, well, you know, I better take you home, Carol. And she's. She's not happy because she was sure he was going to pop the question. You know, uh, just for a little sit, uh, from from a historical perspective, it's kind of funny how a lot of these superheroes kept their, I mean, they kept their secret identity, you know, kind of like Clark Kent did with, with Superman and whatnot, and how Jordan's doing this with, with uh, Carol Ferris. And it's really interesting because a lot of, a lot of men's jobs back then were very secretive, you know, and a lot of times the women didn't, really really ask what men did for a living it was just that he brought home the money you know what i mean so it's kind of interesting how how is treating her kind of the same way in that regards huh it's it's funny i, I think i think it's funny though her that she's mad at him because somebody was drowning and needed help <laughs> <laughs> no carol you're so shallow and, and and then uh she runs into hal the next day and hal hits on her again uh and uh she, you know, the army called and they want their top secret plans back that they gave Hal, um, and he can't find them. Well, let's not let's not forget that he didn't even apologize to her. You know, hi, Carol. No, no. Well, well, at this point, he's Hal, not Green Lantern. So, oh, that's true. That's true. So he he would he would give he would give it up then. He would he can't do that. But uh, he's like, oh boy, you know, the, the these these are gone, and he kind of pulls an Uncle Billy from from uh, It's a Wonderful Life because he. he he loses the blueprints and somebody lifted him off of him. Essentially, he he uses his power ring on his own brain this time <laughs> to to figure what's going on. He's like, I saw this guy somewhere before, and he picks his own memory, and it was the guy that he saw uh, on his day off when he was at the amusement park in Co City. So it sounds like somebody was was following Hal around trying to get their hands on these these blueprints. So Hal uh, puts his power ring in, on and his costume on and, and charges his ring up and off to, the, off to the amusement park he goes. And just as he gets there, wouldn't you know it, a yellow roller coaster car flies off the tracks. <laughs> and then it says, editor's note, due to a necessary impurity in the strange materials from which it was made, Green Lantern's ring has no effect on anything yellow. <laughs> Just a little scientific explanation there for everybody. Yep. So how's got to figure out what am I going to do now? I've got, I've got a yellow roller coaster car. I mean, what's wrong with all these people using the color yellow and everything? Don't they know I have a weakness? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, Hal uses, he puts springs under the roller coaster because the bottom of the roller coaster car is not, not yellow and catches them this way. And just as he gets done, uh, Carol shows up. So now she's a stalker. <laughs> Because she happened to see he was at the amusement park and she just, she just had to come and talk to him. And 
Um, she, she is so sure that he was trying to propose that she really pushes the question on him and says, the last time we were on the bench like this, you started to say something to me. <laughs> or did I, or did I Carol? Or <laughs> yes. In fact, there's something on your mind right now, isn't there? <laughs> the dark faced man. <laughs> what a tart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's one of those clingy girls. And then Hal's like, I got to get away. <laughs> And then, and then what's he do? He runs away again. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. He, he, he goes to the black museum where, where the guy was going that he was trying to, trying to follow. And, uh, it creates a bunch of little mini microphones, which I thought was pretty clever. Yeah. That is kind of cool. A, a little bit of a bunch of, a bunch of microphones to try to hear what's going on. And he finds out what it is. They get the drop on them and they're launching fireworks, which the fireworks are yellow too. Uh, <laughs> they, they tie Hal under a giant, that's one big, one big rocket. <laughs> yeah, that is a big rocket. And uh, Hal saves himself by creating a, a bubble, and uh, gets himself loose, traps the guys, and flies off to stop the missile that was based on the plans. Stops the missile relatively easily because those guys didn't paint it yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and he returns the plans to the army, of course. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so, of course, he's talking to the reporters afterwards, and Carol is like, "I got to talk to Green Lantern again." Uh, so, do you mind if I li- I'd like to give you a little bit of advice? The next time you start to propose to a girl, stay put until you finished. <laughs> and then, and then Hal plays, and then Hal plays dumb. But like, like he wasn't really ready to propose, but boy, she's off in a huff now. <laughs> I love these stories. Oh, it's it's so much fun. I mean, back then, obviously, it was very serious, but now it's just, it's it's fun. You can read this stuff and with with a different set of eyes, that's for sure. Well, not only that, it just makes it more humorous because their relationship is just as tumultuous as it was then, you know? Right, right. I mean, this, this is a, this is, this is a roller coaster ride in and of itself, and this is only the third issue. Yeah, it hasn't changed, people. I'll tell you that much. Their relationship has not changed at all. So, so this next one is the creature that couldn't die. And, uh, you know, Hal's flying and he's testing a plane and he's, you know, concentrating on his job and Carol breaks in on the radio and says, Hal, this is Carol. I'd like you to drive me to Pine City this afternoon. What do you say? (laughs) (laughs) You gotta, you gotta laugh at that because, you know, I mean, you know, no government in its right mind would use closed frequency or nothing. You know? <laughs> right. Right. She, she's the, and, and, and she was the one that was like, we're not mixing business with pleasure, but now she's interrupting Hal while he's on a mission. <laughs> well, then again, I guess Ferris aircraft could be a subsidiary of the government. So maybe I guess she would get away with doing I, that. I, I, I guess, but then, you know, Hal does some skywriting to say, okay, he'll do it. Classy, and, uh, classy move. G- g- you know, that's a way to melt a woman's heart. <laughs> and uh, so they're driving down the road, they're tooling down the road, they're talking and, and you know, the company's talking about merging with a company in Pine City. So that's why they're going there. And, and, uh, but you know, she had something she needed to talk to Hal about. And she basically says to Hal that she had a, she had a really fantastic dream and that in the dream, she agreed to marry Hal Jordan, but only to get Green Lantern jealous, which I'm sure, I'm not sure how that makes Hal feel. Um, and, the dream was so real and she's sitting there in, in her dream, in her wedding dress. Thought Balloon comes up and says, no sign of Green Lantern, but there's only a few minutes left. Is it possible he won't show up? So in the dream, she was sure Green Lantern was going to appear at the last moment to sweep him her away off her feet to carry her away. So they get married. And while she's, you know, the happiest moment of her life, she's getting married to Hal Jordan. She's in her, in her mind saying, Green Lantern failed me. So this marriage would have been off to a great start, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> clearly. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> and she's like, this is terrible. This is a terrible mistake. I wanted to marry Green Lantern, but I married Hal Jordan instead. And just as they're driving on their honeymoon, on their way to their honeymoon, some guy falls off of his ladder. He's painting the side of a building or something. And he falls off his scaffolding. And Hal's like, well, the only thing I can do is use my power ring. So she sees him use the power ring to rescue this guy and realizes, oh, He's the same guy. <laughs> and also worth also worth noting that the, the thing he uses to, to catch that guy, it's it's like an electric bolt again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're back to the electric bolt, but he creates a little mini trampoline to catch him. 
And uh, so Carol has confided because she goes, you know, I'm this morning. I vividly remember that dream. And it occurred to me that I have never seen Green Lantern and Hal Jordan in the same place. So we've we've got the the Lois Lane predicament thrown in Hal's face now. And uh, so she basically points the question right at him. Hal, are you Green Lantern? And he says, well, now, Carol, you ought to know better than to put your faith in a mere dream. And he takes his eyes off the road and they drive off the edge of the road. Like the road has disappeared in front of them. The, <laughs> the, the part of the ground has disappeared in front of them. I They're falling know. to their death. <laughs> and just like the dream, Hal's got to use his power ring to save the day. So he creates a big parachute under the car. He gets down there and is like, well, now oh, I'm going to have to explain this to Carol. And he turns around to find out that she passed out and didn't see anything. <laughs> She looks like she changed clothes because she looked like Mary Marvel for a little while there, and then now in this in this last couple of panels. Well, you're right because she has on kind of a red outfit with a yellow shirt and a yellow hairband, and she's in the car wearing white. Which obviously, I guess, the yellow hairband and yellow shirt don't affect how. Well, I guess they don't affect them. <laughs> I I don't know, but you know, she's not wearing it when she's in the car. She's she's wearing white, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. But uh, Hal discovers that some giant footprints. And he made sure to charge your power ring. He made make sure to let people know that. And they find people and discover that radiation has once again been the culprit and created uh, something from a blob and turned it into a monster. And so Hal's going after the monster. And, you know, God bless him. The monster's not yellow. <laughs> Definitely not yellow. Though, with that said, though, it's, you got to appreciate that the, the, the the artwork for that for that concept alone back then you know those bright oh, yeah. colors you know yeah br- bright bright magenta y pinky looking monster um i want to go with fuchsia fuchsia yeah fuchsia's good yeah I, i'd say fuchsia's good um he can't seem to stop it his ring doesn't seem to work on it um but he does he's not yellow but he does shoot yellow beams out of his eyes i noticed that and the tanks are shooting yellow beams too yeah yeah, yeah the, the explosions are yellow there's some planes going <laughs> after him uh, this, this, this thing's out of control and Hal can't seem to stop him. And then he realizes, wait a minute, he's be feeding off of radiation and radiation is touching everything on earth all the time. And then there's actually an editor's note that says every inch of the earth is bombarded every moment by the mysterious cosmic rays from outer space. So Hal creates a giant test tube that shields off the cosmic rays. And without the creature being fed the cosmic radiation, he shrinks back down into being a blob again. Poor guy. Waste away into nothing. Well, he was happy, though. He, th- he thanks Hal because he wasn't trying to do anything bad because uh, he was really, he didn't know how to control himself and he was trying to get help. And he even says, dead, it's become a lifeless blob. Yep. So Green Lantern saves the day, flies back, changes back into Hal and finds a doctor and he gets back to the car, and Carol, who's now wearing the red outfit again, uh, is 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 she's awake again. She's recovered, and uh, Hal says, "You know, I went to uh, get a doctor for you, Carol, but I see you've recovered." And then when Carol sees the headlines the next day of Green Lantern destroying the cosmic creature, she says, "You know, you were off trying to find a doctor. You can't be Green Lantern." Had her fooled. Yep, had Secret her identity fooled. intact. And and that's it. That's the last thing we see is Hal walking away, leaving Carol behind. And uh, then it ends with a really neat little thing at the, at the end where the editors ask fans that if you liked the adventures of green lantern and you'd like to see him have his own comic book magazine just for himself to write national comics, because it wasn't DC comics yet. And he ends up getting his own book. The rest, as they say, is history. Gotta love history. <laughs> What what a fun three issue debut though! It really is, you know. And I, w- I wish I could take myself back because I remember my first comic book. Actually, the first comic book I read was uh, was GI Joe. I think it was GI Joe issue number one that Marvel put out back in the early eighties. And then, of course, I started getting involved in Superman and, and and Green Lantern and other stuff after that. But back then, as a kid, when I remember reading uh, GI Joe, I was like, "Oh, this is really cool! Explosions, you know." You know, the military's fighting. This is really honorable and all that kind of stuff. And then you had your cool characters and stuff. But I guess reflectively, if I were to come across this as a first impact kind of comic book, you know, I would kind of see it for the bright colors alone, you know, and how it's action packed. 
you know, and has it, and, and even though the stories don't weren't necessarily complex back then, because you notice a lot of stories these days are, are pretty complex in their narrative. You know, they they go issues deep where these don't have that ability. They're, they're, they're self-contained, like you said. Well, and it's interesting to look at these issues and these stories, and they really very much fit what Gil Kane was saying. In uh, He wrote the introduction to this archive edition, and that's where I kind of got that quote from. You can see where the John Broom creates a puzzle for Hal. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a creature that's being fed by cosmic radiation. So it's a puzzle. And Hal has to figure the puzzle out and solve the puzzle and and then wrap the issue up in, in, in the the one ongoing narrative through this entire set of three issues is the relationship between Hal and Carol. Yeah, you're right. That's the only one that's really, really touched upon continuously. And it's interesting, you know, the, those stories back then, one and done stories, but there are, there's a plot thread that plot thread that carries from story to story, but not the driving piece. Well, and it's nice to read it to, for, from a kid's perspective, knowing that the two main characters are Hal and Carol. You know, those are your two primary, your, your two protagonists at the time. So, you know, you're like, those are always your go-to characters. That it's, and, and equally, because I, I think they wrote them both pretty equal when it comes to how they feel about each other in these first three issues. Yeah, yeah. And, and and when you get to the actual first issue, then you get the introduction of the Guardians and you get a flashback of Hal's origin. Um, because for some people that didn't read Showcase 22, they don't may not know Hal's origin, so they do a good job of retelling that right off the bat. But you get the Guardians right from the get-go. And like you said, the rest, as they say, is Green Lantern history. Absolutely. Uh, fun issues. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of our listeners... Uh, Brian Dupont suggested we review those books, and I, and I was surprised looking back over it that we had never done it before. Um, neither you, you and myself together, or or Bill and I, neither one of us, neither one of those combos, we, we've done any in depth uh, discussion about the origins and the first stories. And and they're and they're always good to touch back on the, the earliest editions like this. I mean, if if not just so much for the the Green Lantern stuff itself, but just the historical content that's prevalent in them. You know, and that's one of the things that I've always looked at when I read a lot of the old classical stuff in the Golden Age and the Silver Age or whatnot, is that they're often written around the reflective times that they've been produced in. And you can see it a lot in, in the backgrounds, uh, in certain words and how they talk to one another. Um, just different little bits and pieces you pick up on that history has a stamp on these books and they were written for reasons. No, yep. and, no different these days. And, and, and they're all written from a place of pure adventure and escapism. Yeah, they really were. And they, and a lot of these guys like, like Gil Kane and, 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 and Julie Schwartz and, and, you know, Stan Lee for that matter, were, were just interested in telling really, really good stories, you know, and they were really, really interested in, in giving good stuff to the kids because they were into this kind of this science, sci, I guess I would call it a sci-fi revolution because, you know, in the fifties that would, it produced that, you know, science was a big, big thing back then. And, uh, kids reading this, it's just like candy for them. Absolutely. And, and, and this is what, you know, these stories as silly as they may be and as much fun as we've had at their expense, if it wasn't for these stories, superhero comics, uh, as we know them probably wouldn't exist. I mean, it was flash was successful. He was the first one right out of the gate and, you know, they basically revived the superhero genre and it was this and creating the justice league and that infamous conversation on a golf course that led to Stanley writing the fantastic four and being able to take right. a gamble over at timely comics, which became Marvel comics. Uh, those things all stem from these stories. Well, and not only that, Stan Lee was the first one to write a Spider-Man book without the, the, uh, Comic Code Authority stamp of approval on it and mm -hmm. publish it under mm -hmm. under the, under its banner and you know but I mean a lot of people uh, rail and complain about reboots and, and relaunches and everything and, and what they don't understand is like for comic books for me for them to exist and for them to keep evolving they have to they have to do that because it's been done for years you know and and it has to be done because. I think that's just part of what, what what writing comic books entails. 
because sometimes you get so convoluted and it, it's so many years goes by you need you, you need to do a relaunch or a reinvention of the product line to get people back on board and 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 sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't you know but comic books have went through a lot of history and they almost didn't make it out of the uh, out of the McCarthy era. Uh, you know, they almost didn't make it out of this era. And they almost didn't make it on a number of occasions. Mm-hmm. And the fans kept them alive. And and one of the things that's different between then and now is, uh, you know, back then there was probably a close to a good 10-year gap where there wasn't a Flash and Green Lantern because those books yeah. had gone away. So you yeah. didn't have, like you would today if you suddenly pulled the plug and started over again, you get a lot of backlash back then. Uh, comics were really a kid's medium. You didn't, you know, adults didn't read a lot of comics. So when those characters went away and they were recreated, a lot of fans, a lot of those kids didn't know there was a green lantern and a flash before to begin with. Well, not only that, you didn't, you couldn't take the social media to air out your garbage, you know, and, (laughs) Well, why aren't they writing this about this character? Why, why isn't this character being used? I, I do it myself, you know. Back then, we had you had to write in. As a kid, you had to take the time to write up a letter and write to the editors and stuff. And I remember doing it on a number of occasions. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was definitely, def, definitely a different era. <laughs> it totally was. <laughs> and now you can just send somebody a tweet. Hey, man, great issue. Great first issue. Really enjoyed it. Looking forward to reading some more. And then you get a like and you feel satisfied. <laughs> that, that's right. So uh, I, I've enjoyed this conversation. So we, we should be, we should take a quick pause uh, to catch your breath. And then we do have a couple of pieces of listener feedback. Okay, sounds good. All right. Listen up, Lanterns. It's time you took the oath with Green Lantern John Stewart. In brightest day, in blackest night, don't let the podcast of Oa escape your sight. Those who worship evil's might, beware my power. Green Lantern's Light. All right, everybody, welcome back. Got a couple of listener responses. Going to read the first one for you guys here. This one's from Daniel, and he's responding to episode 146. Daniel says, quote, Thanks for including my comment. You guys rock, and congratulations on 10 years. Here's to many more. Well, you all have to jump in on here because you've been here since the very very beginning since you're the you're the producer of this uh, the maker of this amazing journey that we go on all the time and while i'm just the new person the rookie you're the one that has to uh you know tell daniel what you think 10 years what do you what do you think myron i i just i i thank people for for paying attention when i started doing this stuff i did not think anybody was going to read it or when we started the podcast, I didn't think anybody was going to listen to it. So the fact that anybody's responding uh, makes me happy. You know, I, I'm glad to do this stuff. And uh, I've been slowly going through. I, I discovered not too long ago that the first two years worth of articles on the blog of OA did not translate when I moved from Blogger over to WordPress. So I've been slowly going back and and restoring all the old articles one at a time. I've got to kind of copy and paste them and put new art in and and do that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's going to take me some time to get all that stuff done. But I'm hoping to continue to do this for for a long, long time. So you know, if you enjoy it, I, I do really appreciate it. And and thanks, Daniel, for taking the time out of your day to let us know. You know, and it's funny you mention that. You know, it's a lot of times we sit here and we talk. You know, we do these podcasts, and then you you upload it. And then it, for some reason, you know, you don't know where it's going. Of course, you can look up the data and find out, but you oftentimes don't know who's listening. You know, so who? It's almost like that sci-fi mentality where you where you throw that that recording into outer space and hope that somebody's listening. But in the Green Lantern universe, we're going to chalk it up to only the worthy will tune in and listen to the podcast of Oa. <laughs> well said, Phil. Well said. <laughs> I try. I try. All right. So next one. You want to take this one? You want me to do it? Uh, No, go ahead, Phil. All right. From John. Response to episode 146 as well. Quote, nice podcast, guys. You've got a new subscriber. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the shout out about the little green bubbles. There's the guy that pointed that out for us. Yeah. Yep. So John, welcome aboard. Welcome. Welcome to our little, uh, our little core. We're glad to have you aboard. Um, and, and thanks for pointing the, those things out. You know, I, I love it when people do that. It, it, this is meant to be an interactive medium. So I'm always looking for what people have to say. And, 
And when people make a great point like you did, I, I want to make sure we share it. So I, I look at it as, uh, you know, we're all one big community and things that we find out and see in books that other people miss and we share it, it, it enhances everybody's experience. And that's what we're here for. Well, not only that, he's just helping us. He's helping us out, you know, or for anybody who does do that with other people to point out things like that, you know. I mean, it's not everybody can catch everything all the time. And a lot of things goes unnoticed. And when somebody's there to point it out, it's always helpful. Very much so. So uh, we would love to hear from from you guys that are listening. If you've got any comments, uh, you can certainly reach out and, and contact, contact us or leave a voicemail on our voicemail line. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we should be back in very short order because we're recording this the last few days of September. And we are right on the cusp of the final issue of season one of The Green Lantern. I know. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to this. The the Dark Star storyline. It's going to be good. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, uh, I, this last issue, listening to uh, or reading what Liam Sharp has been saying in social media, uh, looks like it's going to be, as he put it, a knockdown drag out fight. So I, I'm interested in seeing it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And with his artwork, you know it's going to be good. Yeah, yeah. We, we will be back uh, probably within a week or so because I, I imagine we're going to try to record this next week when the issue comes out while it's still fresh. So okay. it won't be long before there's another episode out there. So I thank you all for tuning in and listening. Until next time, please keep your power ring charged, treat each other well, and make every day your brightest day. And we'll listen and we'll see you guys soon. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.